Okay. Uh, welcome everybody to the fall 2021 Great Questions Lecture. Uh, I am delighted to have our guests from the University of Texas at Austin just down the road, uh, although uh, uh, it seems much further uh, separated through Zoom technology, although we're probably just a few miles away from each other. Right. <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Chumi Lai from the University of Texas at Austin. Um, the lecture will be focusing um, on the theme of viewing the moon through Chinese poetry, how the moon connects us across time and space. Uh, Dr. Lai is a professor of instruction in Asian studies and director of Asian studies undergraduate honors at the University of Texas at Austin. And this is her 16th year at, at UT Austin where she teaches Asian studies, UGS and plan two, um, teaching courses on Chinese culture and arts, literature, linguistics and history. Uh, Dr. Lai received her PhD with honors in early medieval Chinese literature from the University of Washington. And we are delighted to have you here to speak about something that we are all very interested in at Great Questions at ACC, which is Chinese poetry. Of course, we spend uh, three classes uh, focused on um, classical Chinese uh, poems, and we look forward to learning more about them with you, Dr. Lai. Thank you so much for being here. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Professor Haji um, I'm. Did, somebody's raised their hand. Is are they having trouble hearing? Perhaps. Oh. Um. Oh, that's. A, I don't that's know. Right. Okay. If yeah, if there's if there if you'd like to um, engage with us, ugh, excuse me, engage with us in the chat. Okay, yeah, everything's. Good. Oh, okay. Uh, All right. Please feel free, and and then when it comes time for the uh, question period, I'm sorry, I should have spoke a little bit about the format. Dr. Lai is going to speak with us um, uh, for uh, at, at at the beginning. We'll we'll listen uh, to to the talk, and then we'll have an opportunity to engage in the Q and A. Uh, and if you do have questions, please feel free to type them in the Q and A, uh, and we'll be able to to respond to them. Uh, once it's time for that question and period. All right. Thank you for having me here. I'm just really delighted to be here to share my passion for poetry um, and to talk about actually uh, connection and uh, through time and how the Chinese poets have actually gifted us uh, a way of viewing the moon. Uh, and I been thinking about this a lot lately, especially since, of course, yesterday was the autumnal equinox, the uh, mid-autumn moon, which is a festival. And uh, we'll talk a little bit later about viewing. We, we won't view tonight because there's going to be a uh, cloud covering, but hopefully we can do it tomorrow night. But I've been thinking a lot about sort of this moon from last night. I hope some of you saw it. It was just so beautiful. Um, and the moon from the past um, and the present. Um, my parents are gone now. And uh, I think about this moon, it's the same moon that they gazed upon when they were growing up. It was the same moon that they actually viewed when they were separated during the war. It was also uh, just the same moon that they had when my father came to America. My mother was still back with, you know, with my older sisters uh, in Taiwan. Um, and now that they're gone, I, I feel that there's still this connection to this moon that they actually saw. But especially in the last uh, you know, two years, I haven't seen family. My sisters and I are still around, of course, but we weren't able to see each other. We were separated, but we still had the moon. Uh, fortunately, we were able to finally see each other this past summer, but uh, the moon has actually taken on more meaning for me. So um, I wanted to share some of that with you. Uh, this is the same moon that also sort of kept the great Chinese poets awake, uh, the insomniac moon, which I'm gonna talk about today, um, and how it brought about some sorrow because they were away from home. Uh, this is the same moon that also sort of connected people as well. And uh, the moon that actually sort of kept the, uh, the Chinese poets uh, company when they were drinking, when they were um, farming uh, and uh, when they were enjoying mountains and rivers and the landscape and communing with nature. So I want to kind of think about the fact that when we view the moon, even in separation, the Chinese poets tell us that we never view these moon, the, the moon alone, uh, that it's all about community and it's about community across time and space. So um, I'm actually going to put up uh, my PowerPoint now and uh, share with you uh, some poems as well as of course some ideas. So I'm gonna read some poems together uh, and uh, Talk about 
talk about a few things uh, to go together with uh, the moon. Um, I'm going to minimize um, the gallery if that's okay. Okay, so I do want to introduce a little bit about classical Chinese poetry, but I do want to focus on the significance of the moon just to sort of narrow down the scope. Uh, the Chinese poets, they did write about sort of viewing the moon, gazing the moon in their own time, but the way that the cultural memory works in poetry is that they were always writing for the community across time and space. The way that I want to sort of have you think about these poems is that yes, they were written in you know, the fifth century, they were written in the eighth century or what have you, but these poems were really written for us today. They meant for us to read these poems, albeit we'll be reading it in translation, uh, but the, the spirit, um, the concept of these poems uh, were written for us. So first I wanna introduce you to this idea of what viewing the moon or gazing at the moon really kind of means. And in Chinese, uh, the moon, uh, the character for the moon actually looks exactly like um, the, sort of uh, the moon itself. And you can see where I've given you sort of the etymology of the script where the sun, the moon, the cart and the horse uh, started out with the Oracle Bone, Oracle Bone script and uh, ended up of course at the very bottom was the sort of the, um, the aspect here of, uh, of the moon itself. So that is actually sort of the moon today. The character for to gaze or to view uh, Wong has actually the character for the moon upon it, in it, if you can see the arrow there. Uh, so gazing at the moon is actually supposed to be also a visual aesthetic. So in the poetry in Chinese, when they talk about viewing the moon or gazing upon the moon, uh, there's kind of a visual sort of pun or visual meme there where the moon, the character for the moon is embedded in the character to gaze. And just as a side note, uh, this idea of Wang is also meaning to look forward to. And in Chinese today, uh, we use that term, this character this word uh, in hope, Xi Wang. So gazing upon the moon is also with hope. Uh, so the significance of the moon in the Chinese culture then is the fact that time uh, is controlled by the ruler historically and is set by the time zone of the regime capital. And even today, there is only one time zone. And so in China today, the one time zone is set by the time zone of Beijing. So the idea then, everyone views the moon at the very same time, even when you are separated. And there's no sort of like, oh, you're 12 hours ahead or you're 12 hours behind uh, as it is today with people who are uh, in China. There's a 12 hours difference between there and Austin, uh, or even if there's like a three hour difference in that sense. So I want you to think about the moon as being kind of the one constant of the past, present and the future. So the Mid-Autumn Festival uh, is sort of the autumnal equinox uh, and uh, you probably heard it called the harvest moon because farmers could still sort of continue with their harvest even as, as it kind of the sun went down. But it's become sort of the analog to how we have Thanksgiving in this country. It's an occasion for gathering of family and friends and you eat uh, things in celebration of the very bright and much larger moon. Uh, so things that are around, moon cakes, uh, pomelo. Uh, I heard that the McDonald's in Japan does sort of moon viewing hamburgers, which is also round as well. But the idea is of course the symbolism of such. So I want to introduce to you, there's so much that I do want to introduce to you, but um, I decided to kind of give you an idea of sort of four categories of what I've organized uh, in understanding classical Chinese poetry, that there are sort of four types of moon and moonlight, the insomniac moon, the companion moon, the enlightened moon, and something called the connection link moon. And I'm going to give you an example of a poem uh, of each. Uh, and I think for those of you who are uh, in the great questions class and studying Chinese, you probably know some of these poems. Uh, some of them are very, very famous. Uh, the poet Li Bai needs no introduction. He's one of the two great poets, Li Bai and Du Fu. And uh, many of his other poems are about drinking with the moon and dancing to the moon. Uh, and I'll share that with you if anyone's interested at the very end of the talk. But 
this is probably the most uh, sort of well-known poem for a lot of reasons is because children memorize this poem uh, from the time that they are young. Uh, this is the kind of poem that even though it was written in the eighth century that nine out of 10 Chinese people, if you just simply started reciting the first uh, two characters of the verse, um, everyone else, most nine out of 10 Chinese can finish the poem. So if I were to say, Tian, most people can finish it and say Ming Yue Guang. Uh, that just kind of is, is part of the collective memory, the cultural memory. And in this is the idea of the insomniac moon is because Li Bai, uh, and it's the most conventional of such, is that the moon is so bright, especially the mid-autumn moon, that it keeps you awake. Um, and if you are separated from your loved ones from home, then you know that they are also viewing the same moon and you long to be there with them, but you have this sort of connection with the moon. So the sadness of the insomniac moon is the fact that you cannot fall asleep. It keeps you up because you long for uh, being back home. Before my bed, the moonlight glitters like frost upon the ground. I look up to the mountain moon, look down and think of home. And I chose this particular version, which is less well known. It was circulated in the Song Dynasty, but um, today the more common version actually in the third line is I look up to the bright moon uh, rather than mountain moon. But I really like the mountain moon because the idea is the fact that mountains in Chinese landscape poetry are sort of can be they're very, they're unmovable. And so they can block one's view as one sort of is looking toward home and looking sort of gazing towards the moon, but the mountain is sort of blocking uh, sort of your visualization of home. And eventually the mid-autumn moon will rise over the mountain and you can connect back with home. The companion moon, uh, and I chose this particular one, although the aforementioned Levi wrote many, many poems in which the moon was his companion, his drinking companion, his walking companion. But I chose this one by uh, an early, very sort of influential poet, Tao Yuanming, also known as Tao Qian. And he was very influential on a lot of the later greater poets. He actually sort of uh, was wildly admired for many things much for his poetry that have actually sort of a uh, realness to it, uh, but mostly because Tao Yuming sort of left court. He was of low nobility grow, uh, birth and he ended up deciding that he didn't want to be serving in a court position as an official anymore. And he also turned down a summons and went home. Uh, he wasn't wealthy enough to sort of survive off of his land, so he needed to be a farmer. Uh, but he was not poor, of course, and so he became effectively the first sort of gentleman farmer that was very influential. And influential and wildly admired for anyone who wanted to sort of quit their job but couldn't basically. So his poetry resonated with many, many, many uh, figures uh, in Chinese history and even today. Uh, I love his poetry. Uh, and this particular set is called Returning to the Farm to Dwell, in which he talks about his life as a farmer, his life living uh, in the countryside. And this is the third of this series. I planted beans below the southern hill. The grasses flourish, but bean sprouts were few. I got up at dawn to clear away the weeds and come back now with the moon on shoulder. Tall bushes crowd the narrow path and evening dew soaks my clothes. Wet clothes are no cause for complaint if things only go as hoped. And Tao Yuming here brings up the very bright and beautiful mid-autumn moon, the full moon, and he's been having to sort of toil uh, all day and he only now can return in twilight, but he's never alone. He's not alone. He has the moon as his companion to accompany him back home. And in Tao Yuming's poetry, we don't find this tension of sorrow, of longing to be with those that, from whom he's separated because he's at home with his family where he wants to be, where he feels he belongs. He does not 
longed for court, so he does not gaze at the moon, wanting to connect with those that he left behind uh, at court. Um, it, this is just absolutely beautiful, and this companion moon, the fact that, uh, I hate to, to say this because it sounds like I'm quoting a pop song, but he'll never walk alone. The Enlightenment moon in the poet that I chose here is uh, Wang Wei, who was a lay Buddhist. He was a practitioner of Chan Buddhism. Uh, you may know it better as Zen Buddhism. Um, and in this particular piece, uh, Wang Wei, who's actually very well-to-do, had a beautiful estate. And he wrote a lot of these sort of quatrains at each different site, meditation sites uh, on his estate. If you were to just read Wang Wei's poetry alone, you would think that he actually followed the life of Tao Yuming, but actually he never left high office. Uh, this was kind of his escape. And the reason why I call it the Enlightenment Moon is that he builds in the language of desiring, seeking enlightenment in his poems. And so where Tao sort of sweats and his clothes are wet with dew with the moon on his shoulder, um, the most active phenomenon that we want to think about in Wang Wei's poetry is actually the sudden brightness. And so in the case of this particular poem, Wang Wei has many of these poems where it's the suddenness of the moonlight um, and it is the enlightenment that he seeks, uh, that he craves. Um, where the moon is Tao's companion uh, in the lateness of the day as he returns from the field, the moonlight for Wang projects associations of instantaneous enlightenment, uh, hoping to escape the cycle uh, of samsara of this life and the fact that uh, there's also a wakefulness to this uh, waking to enlightenment. And this is one of the sites uh, of kind of a bamboo sort of forest or copse uh, in which he's built a little bit of a simple cottage. Sitting alone in the secluded bamboo copse, plucking the zither and whistling long. Deep in the woods, no one is aware. The bright moon comes, shining on me. And many of Wang Wei's poems are about kind of a snapshot. Um, they're really beautiful poems that don't translate that well into English because Wang Wei is actually giving us snapshots uh, that he sees images from his mind. So finally, we come to something that I'll spend a little bit more time on is the connection link moon. And in the case of Du Fu, who's sort of uh, shoulder to shoulder with Li Bai as sort of the, the two great poets in Chinese poetry, and especially from the golden age, the Tang Dynasty, uh, Du Fu is much more of a words craftsman uh, than Li Bai. They both were brilliant, but Li Bai, where he gives the effect of having just dashed off a poem, Du Fu sort of gives us and wants us to share in sort of the laborious sort of effort of crafting his, his language and his words. Uh, you may not be able to see, uh, but in the Chinese, uh, the great translator David Hawkes actually had to add in quite a bit to fill in the ellipsis uh, in Chinese poetry. And so Du Fu as a sort of a craftsman, he not only was just sort of um, famous for being a wonderful sort of poet in terms of sort of crafting his imagery, is the fact that Du Fu had the unfortunate, or shall we say fortunate, uh, lot in his life to hit upon one of the great tragedies in Chinese history, uh, the Anushan Rebellion of 755, in which the great Tang Empire was overthrown. They did regain it, but during this sort of very um, sort of period of the coup, uh, Du Fu himself had been caught in it. And um, he actually was, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing story. He was trying to get to uh, serve the court that had been overthrown, which had been, had been relocated. And he was dressed as a peasant, uh, but he gets captured by some bandits types. And they didn't realize that he was of nobility. Uh, so they made him uh, kind of a laborer. Uh, a porter of sorts to carry their bags. And so he ended up going, uh, being sort of dragged back, uh, uh, back to the capital that had been sacked. 
So Du Fu ended up writing quite a bit of poetry about this time, which is why he is known uh, in Chinese poetry as the poet historian. Um, really a true eyewitness account of, uh, of war, of overthrow. And at that time, right in that moment, he takes us there of believing that it was the end of the great empire. And when he wrote this poem for his wife, um, Mid-Autumn Festival, I think he believed that it was going to be the last mid-autumn moon that he was going to see. I believe he thought not only was the end of the empire, I think he thought it was the end of his life. And he had earlier taken his wife and children to safety. Uh, so Moonlit Night is about a poem for his wife. Two things that I want to kind of have you think about when I read this poem is that out of social decorum, a man does not speak of his wife. A man does not mention his wife. It is too public. Uh, so it is a social decorum thing. And so the translation here is my wife, but in the Chinese is simply uh, in the chambers. Uh, so what allowed and what made Du Fu sort of break this sort of cross this line of social decorum in actually sort of sending really a final love poem to his wife uh, is that I think you break these social lines of social decorum when you think it's the end. So this is called Moonlit Night. Tonight in Fuzhou, my wife will be watching this moon alone. I think with tenderness of my faraway little ones, too young to understand about their father in Chang'an. My wife's soft hair must be wet from the scented night mist and her white arms chilled by the cold moonlight. When shall we lean on the open casement together and gaze at the moon and the tears on our cheeks are dry? This is just a heartbreaking poem because Du Fu thinks he's never going to see his wife or children again. But he draws comfort from this connection link of the moon that they are viewing this same moon. She and the children are in Fuzhou in safety, and he's in the sacked capital in Chang'an. Uh, dressed as a peasant um, and uh, feeling that the end of the empire, the end of his life is nigh. And he projects forward. And this was quite innovative for Tang poetry, for Chinese poetry to play with time in this way. I won't bore you with the nature of Chinese language, but there is no uh, conventional tense in classical Chinese language or in modern Chinese language. And so it's very difficult to sort of um, express it. You have to decide as a translator what tense to use is what I should say. But in Chinese, there is this sort of flexibility that is there's a timelessness to it uh, because of the lack of tense. Now, so therefore, Du Fu makes an effort to actually project forward that he is thinking of the future, Wang, Xi Wang, with hope, that as he gazes upon this moon, he projects forward to a time when he and his wife can be together side by side and viewing the next mid-autumn moon together. And when the tears are dry, meaning the fact that whatever adversity that the empire is going through, their own personal sort of separation uh, will have passed. And it's just a beautiful use of time. Uh, it was so innovative uh, and the likes of this has actually uh, never been seen again until modern times, just simply because Du Fu really created this sort of notion of looking forward and sometime looking back to this time when they will have remembered that they were once separated, but they're now together. Two things that I want to sort of say about this, uh, besides the fact that he um, talks about his wife, is that he also describes his wife in somewhat of an eroticized manner. And the way he talks about her hair is scented with nightness, so it's wet and so her hair is down. And a woman would have her hair down 
only to her lover or to her husband. And if she had a maidservant, <laughs> to the maidservant. So he's actually giving us a very private, intimate sort of view of his wife. And I think it's because it's one of his sort of feelings that he was never going to see her again. And the other aspect of it is the fact that he also mentions her white arms um, that are chilled by the cold moonlight. And again, it's a similar idea of sort of the bare arms that only a husband will see. And so it's, it's this is just a beautiful poem and it's just so heart wrenching uh, in it. Uh, and I think this is also a note has a note of optimism because he feels that they will be together again. He projects forward. So the moon can sort of do this for, for all of us, I think, uh, connecting us um, and with hope as well. So the moon is this one constant. We view the moon collectively. We, we're never alone. The moon is always, always with us, whether it's waking us up, whether it's a keeping us company, uh, whether it's actually allowing us to think of our loved ones. And it's, I think, a way to connect with those who have passed and once view the same moon, uh, those from whom we are separated, no matter the distance. You can be hundreds of miles, uh, you can be 20 miles apart uh, from those from whom we are separated. And I want to kind of leave you with this one thought, is that the moon also connects us with those in the future who will view the same moon in the future. Thank you so much. I look forward to your great questions. Thank you very much. That was splendid. Uh, and in that last poem was so beautiful and your interpretation of it was, uh, was very moving. Thank you. It's, it's a beautiful poem. And if I could share an anecdote, um, when I teach Chinese poetry uh, at UT, I, I teach it in English on purpose because I want people who don't have any background to join in. And occasionally uh, I have people from the UT Missioner Center uh, take the class. They are poets, they are uh, fiction writers, novelists, uh, and they're in the fine arts program, of course, at the Missioner Center. And one year I had this uh, poet who was taking my class and she was so moved by Moonlit Night that she wanted to not so much do a translation because she didn't read Chinese, but she wanted to write her own sort of interpretation of Du Fu's. And so it was kind of like a, a poet in, a poet who was interpreting and semi-translating uh, Moonlit Night. And her poem was just so beautiful where she, not knowing Chinese, she understood, but she captured the emotion uh, of that. But thank you.